1. I was never a religious person, but around the age of 22 I had formed a relationship with a guy that was a Byzantine painter. His job was to create portraits of saints and was also working in church restoration. It just so happened that back then he was working in a big church on an island, and he was restoring fresco paintings on the walls. I went along to catch a bit of vacation for my work since it was on a sunny island, and since I wanted to also help him out, I was in charge of climbing up and down the scaffold that we had placed on the walls and bringing him different tools. The job had to be done at night since during the day with all the people visiting the church it was impossible. It was one of those nights while we were working upon the scaffold that a strange happening took place in the big church. Before I continue a little info about the entrance, the entrance had two doors, one heavy wooden door several meters high on the outside that had about the thickness of a human body and took two people to open it and close it. It was locked with a heavy metal lock and a big latch that was on the inside, about half the size of a child's arm. The priest would lock from the inside and then use a small normal sized door to exit the church. Then after that, there was a small hall and a second glass door, with heavy double glass and similar height as the main entrance of the church, which would also lock with a big metal lock. During the night, both those doors were locked safely. Now back to the strange happening. At first we heard a loud banging sound coming from outside the door and the ground of the inside of the church started to shake, as if a huge earthquake was happening. We were very surprised and since the original sound came from the entrance, we both turned around to look at what was happening while holding on to dear life from the scaffold that was several meters above ground. We saw with our own eyes the heavy outside wooden door pop open as if it weighed nothing. The force was so strong that it broke the lock. The huge latch that was on top came out of its place and flew in the air hitting the wooden frame of the glass door and ending up on the ground. We were left with our jaws hanging open. After the door popped open there was nothing behind it, nothing at all. No humans, no bulldozers, no crew of bodybuilders. It was just the dark woods that we could see beyond the door. Then the second sound came. The glass door started shaking as if a giant was holding it from both sides and was trying to crush it. The door was shaking so violently that it looked like it would come out of its position on the wall and shatter like a glass toy. That went on for several minutes. That felt like an eternity. And all that time we were just frozen, looking towards the invisible force that was trying to break down the entrance. But the second door didn't shatter. Instead, as if nothing had ever happened, everything stopped abruptly. Not a single sound was heard after that. We managed to get our shit together and climbed down from the scaffold, leaving everything behind while running towards the side exit. Before leaving, we managed to remember we had to flip the circuit breaker to turn all the lights off, and so we did. After leaving the church, we run towards the room we were given by the priest to sleep in. They were guest rooms they had available for visiting priests, artists working at the church, or people that needed a place to sleep. It was located behind the church and was two stories high, so it was overlooking the church. We looked out the window and all the lights were suddenly turned on, every single one of them. All of the windows around the church were emitting a bright light. We had for sure turned the circuit breaker down before exiting, because it was placed next to the side entrance but now all the lights were turned on. That lasted about 10 minutes and then the church became dark again. At that point, there was no way we could get any sleep. We just waited for the dawn to come. We took the decision to call the priest at the crack of dawn to arrange a meeting before he headed to the church, so we can tell him what happened. We certainly did not want to get blamed for a broken door. He listened to us silently. Even after we were finished, he did not say a word. He did not blame us for any of this either. He just accepted it all as if it was a natural thing, and he already knew about it. He only called a specialized locksmith to repair the damage at the door and the latch. We never received any explanation for this, and my now ex-boyfriend stopped working there altogether. Of course, I also never stepped foot in there again, and until today, several years later, I haven't got the slightest idea about what that was. 2. There is an old legend in Virginia of a road in Yorktown called Crawford Road. 
There are tons of ghost stories about that road, one being an African-American lady that hung herself off of the bridge and can still be seen hanging herself off the bridge if you go under and look behind you. There are other stories of soldiers walking down the road, lights in the distance, and cars stalling when you park under the bridge. There are a lot more stories that you can look up on your own, but this is the story of me and my friends' experiences down that road. I am not personally a believer in ghosts because I never saw one until that night. To keep the identities of my group safe, I will be referring to myself and me as my friends as W, N, J, and A. So to start this story, we were talking about some paranormal experiences and me and W mentioned that we have never had a paranormal experience before. So W was determined to have one that night and wanted to know of a haunted location. I remembered a friend of mine that lives in Yorktown was telling me of the legends of Crawford Road and I brought it up to the group. We checked the time it would take to get there and decided to kill some time until it got dark. All the while, we were reading up different stories online to see what we were getting into. Needless to say, everyone was pretty excited, but we were not prepared for what would happen. Once night hits, we go down the road and don't see anything unusual, as many other cars were also going down the road. But there was a cop sitting at the top of the bridge. So we decided to go get some food while we wait a bit longer for the road to get less busy and the cop to leave. About an hour later, we go back down the road, and once we get to the bridge, there is another group of people on the road as well, looking to see what they could find. We talk for a bit, and they say they haven't seen anything, so our group goes up to the top of the bridge to see what we can find. We are all up there, and we don't really see anything, besides a strange symbol on the road. And a graffiti dick. We see a car coming, and we didn't really want to get caught up there, so me, W, and A go back down, while N and J stay up there and turn their lights off. After less than two minutes, we see N and J running down and freaking the fuck out. They said they both saw a tall woman dressed in white walk out of the woods and to the bridge. Obviously, like idiots, our group walks up to see. We couldn't see her when we were up there, but as we looked down the road to see if we could find anything, all of a sudden we hear an angry scream off in the distance. We all book it out of there, and the other group bailed as well as soon as we heard the scream. We start to drive away from the bridge, and being determined to see an actual ghost, all of us had our windows down and were taking constant pictures while driving. Eventually, we hear a panicked Jay tell us to drive fucking faster, and he is sticking his head out of the window. Once we get far enough away, he said that he saw something on four legs running after the car. This was only the start. We begin to look at the pictures we have taken and watch the video W had been taking the whole time we were down there. In the video, when we heard the scream and start to run, we could clearly hear a gargled cackle that we didn't hear at the moment. And the pictures were even worse. Some of them were nothing, but a lot of Jay's photos had a mysterious glow in them. And one of N's photos were completely white. The rest were fine. In some of the photos, we could see a strange blue box in both Jay and A's pictures which was made even worse because they were on opposite sides of the car. And the worst one was when N took a picture of the side view mirror, could clearly see a face with two black eyes. We were probably freaked the hell out and we decided to drive down the road one more time and do the same thing and take pictures on all sides of the car. While going down it, we didn't see anything of interest, until at the bridge. When Jay said he saw someone in white waving at the car, but the pictures were a completely different story, as one of the pictures that Anne got was of a four-legged creature sitting on top of a broken fence post like it was waiting for us. After that, we decided to get out of there and finally get home. When we get back, we can clearly see a large handprint and a small handprint on the window on Jay's side. We also see a multitude of other handprints on the car as well as scratch marks. And on the back of the car, we can see the same symbol as on the top of the bridge. When I got home, I looked into further detail about the stories from others, and found out that the scream was something of a call to others on the road, which would explain the creature chasing us. But I haven't been able to find a single one about a four-legged creature chasing them. This had to be the scariest night of my life, and we were all planning to come back to Crawford Road and see what else we could find. 
3. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I lived in a very weird house. It had some serious history with what it had been and how it was built. The house itself was built in 1910 and sometime around 1940. The front of the house was expanded with a large storefront style front end added that was turned into a repair shop of some kind. When the expansion to the house happened, they extended the basement. The basement was one long corridor about 60 feet long, but this is where it got weird. It was the early 60s, it went from being a repair shop to an underground brothel and the basement had a whole line of rooms on the left side that were big enough for a twin bed and a night table. There were seven rooms like this, each the same as before in design. At the very end of the basement was one larger room which was about the size of the king beds to give a visual image. Along the main corridor were pillars in the middle of the walkway outside of each room, and they all had large loops like you would find for tying up horses or cattle but the house had no history of being a farm-based house. In the early 70s, there was a man who killed seven of the working ladies at the brothel and then killed himself. The city obviously shut it down at this point, and it was sold later to be turned into a concert hall in the front storefront style era. So needless to say, the house was interesting at best, but for a bunch of 17 and 18 year olds, it was the most fucking lit place to rent. It was a constant party house, but it was ours. The front area we turned into a lounge with a crap load of couches and tables for doing what teens in their first place do best. In the end, the house was paid for by me and three other friends. Before living here, I didn't believe in ghosts or anything of that. But after living in that house, even to this day, I don't fully know how to explain the events that occurred. But it started out where the unexplained things we just thought were someone else in the house. One day my friends and I were all sitting in the back room of the house. When we heard a loud crash. We looked out to see the light in the kitchen strobing and our ferret was screaming who we kept in a cage in the kitchen and dining area. We heard another slam and can see his cage in the light side past the doorway. We obviously ran to find out what was going on but when we entered the kitchen there was nothing there. Just our little dude freaking the fuck out. We couldn't ever figure out what was going on, but when this happened, it got us all talking about our own events. Over the course of the next few months, we started to gain a feeling for each one of the... spirits that shared the house with us. I don't know how to put it, but... we felt there were at least two good, warm-feeling spirits and one very angry and violent one. We started having physical interactions with them, which to this day I can't fully explain, other than what felt like a warm hand on your shoulder kind of experience. And then the other, which resulted in what looked like burns and scratches. When we lived there, we had a set of three paintings that made up one painting. When we put them on the wall in the correct order, they would get ripped off the wall. Sometimes we would come home to them on the other side of the room. And other times it would happen with us watching, like when we were sitting around drinking or whatever else. Now if we put them up in the wrong order, nothing ever happened to them. In the end, they lived in the wrong order for this reason. We had a number of stereos in the house, and they would all go to white noise after listening to them. These were the old style with knobs to change the stations around. So we ended up taping them in place, but they would still sometimes go to white noise anyway. After living there for two years, we gave names to them. We named them Rose and Jill for what we can only assume were the two working girls, and Henry. The killer, we think. We dubbed the mean one that would inflict pain and anger in the rooms. Henry would also slam doors and cupboards, sometimes would throw plates or glasses. When we would take showers, the mirrors would show handprints in the condensation, and we would hear what sounded like faint women talking when no one else was home. One night, my friend and I were throwing a Nerf football back and forth. The ball bounced and hit a large white vase that was in the house when we moved in. It fell over and crashed on the floor into pieces. We felt like this must have made Henry angry because both of us felt burns and scratches on our backs. A raised welt kind of scratches. And his activity level skyrocketed for the next week or so. 4. While visiting my family in the island of Lombo, Indonesia, 
I heard what I believed to be a witch known as a Laok fall from the sky onto our roof. I have lived in Australia my whole life, but my dad, who is from Indonesia, has family over there. Three years ago, when I, along with my mum, dad, and sister, were staying with my dad's family, something creepy happened. We were sleeping in a back room of my uncle's deli, under a corrugated iron ceiling. The room was small and only had one small window which was just a square cutout, with four or five metal rods in it, kind of like what you imagine a jail cell would have. The window had a small curtain over it. In the middle of the night, my whole family, mum, dad, sister, and I suddenly woke up to an extremely loud bang on our roof, followed by scratching. The sound was too loud to be created by something as large as a cat or dog. There were no trees for an animal to jump or fall from anyway. My mum, who has never experienced anything paranormal living in Australia her whole life, became a little worried. Even she was suspecting something paranormal. My dad wasn't surprised, though. He has told me many stories about things like this when he lived in Indonesia. The next morning, my dad told his brothers and sisters about what happened. They weren't surprised either. They told him that recently, almost every night, Laoks have been running around on people's roofs. They described them as humans with crow-like wings running, flying, and screaming. Pretty much next to my uncle's deli and our land, there is a village, which has their own culture and beliefs, etc. My other uncle married a woman from that village, so our family are quite close with the people. In that village, there is like a shaman man and woman called a Dukun. They're an old couple who the villagers always come to when there is a problem with spirits and stuff. The wife is just a small old lady whose teeth are stained reddish black due to chewing on betel nuts all day long. The husband, I don't remember what he looked like. My family visited them once because they wanted to perform some kind of ritual with us. Maybe to cleanse us or something. Anyway, my dad told me that the Dukun suspected that there was a few Laoks in the area. A lady and her mother lived in the house next door to my uncle's deli, were the ones who they suspected. They thought that it was best to just keep it to themselves and not accuse the ladies of something like this. The creepy thing is, the neighbor's house was next to our room, right where the small window was. In the few nights that I stayed there, I, who was sleeping right next to the window, had a terrible night's sleep. I woke up with really bad heat rash and just sheer uncomfort. My dad told me that several times in the night, he noticed that the curtain on the window was opened, even after he kept closing it. He also had strange feelings that someone was looking in. A little bit of information about Laox. They are human beings who practice black magic, causing them to turn into a supernatural being. In each region of Indonesia, there are different types of creatures like this, with different names and appearances. But in Bali and Lombo, it is known as a Laok. During the day, they appear as a normal human, but at night, they leave the house and do whatever they do. You can learn more about them online. Just search L-E-A-K or L-E-Y-A-K, which. 5. Hey guys. I thought I would share a few moments from the two and a half month long experience I had last summer. I've been wanting to share this for a while. It scared me so much I'm genuinely considering seeing a therapist for it. Because I can't sleep without a light on now. Maybe sharing will help me gain some peace of mind, who knows. So, last year, I flew overseas to work at a summer camp on the east coast of the US. I don't want to disclose the location, as to not dent the camp's credibility or scare any kids who shouldn't be on here. And it was all well and good for the first week and a half. There was no mention of ghosts. If there was, it was usually in a joking context and I would brush it off. As people using cliches to get a rise out of the new counselors, as you do. Anyway, some important information to know about the camp, which I didn't know until halfway through the summer. Although it has changed hands a few times and also changed names, the camp itself is over 90 years old. It was built in the 1920s, and it stands on what used to be the grounds of a Native American settlement. 
Another thing to know is that during staff training all the female counselors were in one building, which was divided into three cabins. And the guys were in another cabin on the opposite side of the camp. My bunk for the first two weeks was in the middle cabin of the girls' building. So now that's out of the way, I can move on to the paranormal stuff. Firstly, from the moment I arrived, the camp just felt off. Like being watched, no matter where I went. I just ignored it at first because I was a long way from home. And the US can be a bit of a culture shock. I come from England, so it felt like everything was the same but moved to the left. Things started happening a week and a half into training, like I mentioned before. Everyone was exhausted from said training, and we also had a curfew to be back from the staff lounge and in our cabins at 11 at the latest. So we were all asleep by midnight. If you have any experience working at a summer camp, then you will know that sleep is a sacred gift from above that can't be wasted unless you want to feel like a zombie the next day. So when you were out, you were out for the count. Which is why I found it odd that I woke up at 2.50 in the morning for no apparent reason to a really odd feeling in the room. The only way I can describe it is kind of impending doom or something is coming so you need to hide kind of feeling. I had also just had a dream about the cabin being haunted which contained the same feeling. So the fact that it stayed when I woke up was a little unsettling to say the least. I rolled over and pulled the covers up over my head due to said feeling and aggressively tried to get to sleep as fast as I could, which didn't work. And when it hit 3am, everything went eerily silent for a few seconds. Then footsteps walked into the room. They were really loud, and whatever it was, was walking barefoot. I can remember wondering if it was the sound of one of the window fans playing up for a second. But then I realized it was walking in paces of threes and fives, really slowly. This was followed by an even more horrifying realization that it was starting to do rounds of everyone's bunks to see who was sleeping in them, and that it was making its way towards mine. As a side note, I'd like to add that I was fully lucid and was not suffering from sleep paralysis. I was trying not to hyperventilate, and it took every part of my being to try and stay still. I'd never known fear like that. I felt like if I gave myself away and it knew that I was awake, I would die. I also had no drugs in my system and have no history with hallucinations. If I did, I wouldn't have been clear to work at camp. I also knew no one in any of the cabins were awake, because I shone my phone's torch around the room and checked the bunks. Everyone was comatose and no one woke up whilst this was happening, no matter how much I wanted them to. The footsteps also started in the doorway not in the hallway or the room itself. Anyway, getting back to the crux of the situation. This thing eventually gets to my bed and stops. For ages. Like a good three to five minutes. My guess is it was waiting to see if I was going to give myself away and show that I was actually conscious. I didn't, thank God. But hell, the feeling was so thick in the air I could almost feel it lean over and try to get a look at my face. Eventually, I heard it turn and walk away and continue doing its round. And it continued to do this three or four times within the hour, within ten minute intervals between each round. And I checked the bunks again with my phone torch in hopes that someone was awake every time it went quiet for a while, but no one was. And every time it came back around, it would stay at my bunk for longer and longer each time. It stopped at 4am and I had to get up at 8 I didn't get much sleep that night, and I asked around the female counsellors, but they were all oblivious to it save one of my cabin mates, who claimed to have seen a shadowy figure out of the corner of her eye in the cabin after she got back late from the staff lounge the night before. My cabin came up in conversation at breakfast. I hadn't even brought up what happened, and two of the people who have worked here for a few years started talking about how it's haunted and how weird stuff happens there every year. Footsteps being one of many things. This is literally just the tip of the iceberg. Everything started to snowball after that, but I would literally be here for years trying to tell it all in one go. So I'm going to try and summarize it in a nutshell, and if anything sticks out to you guys, just ask me and I will elaborate. The disembodied footsteps returned. People kept seeing shadow figures, campers, and counselors. A ghost of a girl fully manifested in our building to multiple witnesses. 
I heard a banging on the outside walls of the cabin, all the way around, and it's fifteen feet up at the back. An entire stack of shelves was pushed over in the middle of the night. Weird stuff has happened with the fairy lights, multiple witnesses again, where they were moving on their own and we had a girl who could see spirits in the cabin. She was full on psychic, even admin believed her. She'd tell you things about your dead grandparents only you would know. She could tell you what different types of spirits look like, and apparently, there was a male spirit she's never seen before in the cabin. She was almost possessed a year before last by a spirit she calls the Pale-Faced Man. We have heard whispering in the cabin when it was empty. Really weird dreams about the camp being haunted, and something being wrong in the cabin. Waking up to that feeling of complete and utter dread. Feeling someone sit down in your bed in the middle of the night, and the mattress sinking down. Shadows on the wall with no person making them. There was one night where everyone in the cabin was waking up at the same times throughout the night, feeling weird and terrified. We also had paranormal activity in the drama hall, and some of the boys' cabins. A Ouija board that kept disappearing and reappearing sporadically. There were also rumors going around our camp and other camps that a kid drowned in our lake and that someone was shot by an active shooter. I can't say these rumors happened, but they didn't help the situation. Trust me, it got so bad that some of the counselors started saying prayers if they had to go in the middle of the night. Oh, and we also had an underwear ghost. So yeah, not quite the experience I was expecting when I went to work at a summer camp. I went to build on my character and returned a nervous wreck. I can't quite believe it happened, but it will be burned into my memory forever. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 136. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Ah, now that reminds me, the mention, it's probably a sick thing to be reminded of, but when they mentioned the, the rumour... And, and the summer camp story about the kid being drowned in the lake. Uh, I'm just about ready to start buying stuff for my fish tank now. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to get the figure, though, because they go for about 30 quid or more if you get them on Amazon. You can get the used ones for a bit cheaper, but I have seen them on AliExpress. I've never ordered from there, so I'm not sure. Uh, it seems to be the exact same figure, and I've watched people review it, with uh, and they, they say in the reviews that they don't really know if it's a knockoff or not. But what I have noticed in the reviews for the, these particular figures, uh, and I'll explain what I'm doing with it in a minute for those I haven't, um, for those who I may not have mentioned it to, uh, is that they look identical in every way, is well made, all the articulation, everything's correct to the actual proper figure. The only thing I've noticed is that the packaging always looks damaged. So I'm wondering if it's basically just figures that have been bashed about a bit and they've ended up getting sold uh, sold off cheaper and they end up on AliExpress. So I'm wondering if that's the case and it's actually a genuine figure. Uh, I'd hope so, but I don't know for sure. But that being said, I'm going to submerge the thing in a fish tank anyway, so I don't think it really matters uh, if it's uh, perfect as long as the paint's not toxic and they don't seem to be. Uh, so what I'm doing is I need the part 6 one. I believe it's part 6. That's the one with the gloves. And there's a little set as well you can buy, and I'll, I'll get that. And it's got a number of other things in it, but it's got a rock and a chain. So if those of you who are fans, fans of Friday the 13th will uh, know that Jason eventually gets um, sunk to the bottom of, of Crystal Lake. And I'm going to recreate that scene for my fish tank. Uh, I'm also getting some kind of glow. Um, I'm getting regular gravel. I think it's like blue and white. I'm also going to get some to sprinkle in it that, that actually glow in the dark. So that'll be pretty cool as well. Uh, and I'll just... <laughs> the last thing is I'll have to figure out where I'm going to get fish. There used to be shops in the town I live in, but I'm not sure if there's any anymore. I'll have to check. If not, I might be begging a lift off my brother-in-law. We'll see. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves.